Alright, welcome to another... It's the wrong beginning, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah, draft science, our draft physics video presentation. Alright, subject will be um, the two-slit experiment, the single-slit, whatever, uh, surface experiments, and an explanation, uh, counter-explanation to the conventional field vibration stuff um, that explains why there are um, patterns created in terms of what light can be received. So, um, uh, over the years, I've had different explanations, counter explanations, that all sort of involve the two facts that there are that we know that light spreads when it goes next to a surface, and, the, and that um, it spreads selectively based on frequency. And I've attempted to provide explanations that have to do with uh, the fact that surfaces aren't simple objects, they're complex objects. So I guess we'll do a little bit of the, that stuff first. Um, uh, just for the sake of clarity, uh, it's close enough, I guess. Might be able to move it over just a hair that way. Okay. Yeah, we really don't need all that silver crap over on the other side, do we? No, we don't. Don't need that either. All right, good enough. <coughs> uh, you'll have to do. Uh, yeah, eventually I'll have a studio of some kind and blah, 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 but not right now. All right, the first thing to be known about photons is how we receive them. That is, whether you think it's waves or ether thingies or whatever, the idea is is that there's nodes, there's some some idea of a clump to a photon, and that you need a certain number of the clumps um, to see the photon. That is, uh, our eye needs, let's say, six, and maybe a photon multiplier or, um, would need, um, say, three as a minimum. It can't see the frequency unless there's enough of the frequency provided. And you could argue the same is true for radio and other mechanisms. The, the things we use to see the energy is dependent on the energy having some volume to it. There has to be enough of it in the right order. And it has to be this specific frequency, this specific wavelength. Um, and if one of them's this instead of that, uh, that will not do. And it won't be seen. I guess I should make that more dramatic, that that distance is longer, and <laughs> this distance is shorter. Um, so it needs there to be a regular impulse, and it needs to hit a certain amount of surface of uh, metal or whatever we're using to detect it. The, the, um, the event of the frequency can't, one piece of it can't hit way over here, okay? and then have the other pieces all over here kind of thing. That won't work. It all has to hit a certain area of, of space. And uh, that's essentially the polarization of the light um, for the frequency to be, um, to do what it needs to do to this material. The atoms in the material need to do a specific thing. Uh, let's just say they need to expand, uh, bend, uh, and um, to transmit uh, the signal as either transmitting as being transparent, the material, or transmitting it in terms of creating an electrical signal that says on and on and on, you know, on, off, on, off, a frequency that can be converted into electricity. So that's the first thing to understand is how we detect photons is not... Um, it has subtleties and uh, rules, and that's just a fact. Um, all right, so as I have proposed, um, I'm arguing that photons are essentially clumps of energy, momentum, quanta, okay, and that they're at a specific frequency, and that they can have all kinds of them can be mixed in the same area of space. Um, doing this thing where they're just going to hit a surface and you know they're spread over a certain distance um, as I've pointed out what <clears throat> we think of as a photon has a spread in terms of the little 
little clumps that have the right frequency. So these all have the right frequency, but their their uh, arrangement is <coughs> this distance here <coughs> is often closely related to this distance here, the wavelength and the amount of uh, out of order, uh, lack of um, <coughs> straight. They're not all traveling the same exact path. They're not right behind each other. They're a little bit out of order, like a gun moving up and down as it shoots the bullets. <coughs> they don't have a perfect order, so the polarization can be thought of as like if you hit a target with 20 bullets and the <coughs> there's a spread of your bullets. That's essentially the polarization of the <coughs> what could be called the ray of bullets. All right. <coughs> So, the idea of a surface, and so let's just say we can talk about slit experiments and, um, you know, a key fact that needs to be recognized is that it's, they're really, it's about these surfaces. And so it's really what you're saying when there's a single slit, you're saying the two surface experiment. And then this double slit would be the four surface experiment and you can sort of see it with your own you can put your finger up to your eye looking at a light source and you'll see the fuzzy edges and you'll even might even see a few interference lines <laughs> that aren't really interference lines but anyway um, and uh, you know so this is something single surfaces do you don't need two surfaces and let's just understand that mathematically that's sort of demonstrated by the fact that they'll call this variable of this opening, they'll give it a, a label like D, and then in the case of the double slit, they're going to give this the label of D for distance. And the only thing these two things have in common, this is an opening and this is a, a blockage, and here the same variable is going to be used in the math for these two very different things, a blockage and a, a distance or width of the slit. And the reason why that works is because that is actually the same if you just think of it as how far apart are the surfaces. So D would be the same in both if all you're measuring is how far apart are surfaces. And um, <clears throat> the real players in the double slit experiment are the obviously the players that are going to have the most light hitting them are going to be these two surfaces. So they would be the relevant surfaces to the pattern you're getting. So that's an explanation for um, that mathematical irregularity and why that mathematical irregularity doesn't mean anything. All right. So continuing further. So let's just talk about a surface. I mean, let's just, we'll put two in here for the sake of uh, the fact that you need two, <laughs> you know, in some cases. Um, and so what's actually going to happen to the the light <coughs> as it goes in uh, to the surfaces as a different grouping of frequencies so there's lots of little bits coming in and what's happening to them um, as pointed out they're not in perfect order or regularity in terms of their spatial connections to each other so if there were no surfaces here a certain amount of this stuff would be coherently received by surfaces. That is, they'd vibrate at the right frequencies and they would register some light. Now, I would argue that the amount of light they're going to register is going to be less than the energy that's actually going in. Um, that, they're <laughs> that they're only going to... Um, uh, one crystal will say this was a red bit of vibration, another crystal will say this is a blue so the atoms are going to interpret what they're going to get hit by and in any one minute they might say I'm getting hit by a blue bit or I'm getting hit by a red bit uh, in terms of the frequency it's going to acknowledge the existence of or create an electric signal because of um, so anyway so <clears throat> and the light comes through what's going to happen is the surface is actually going to uh, wipe out some of these bits and so some of the photons you can understand have a spread to them of um, <clears throat> well, you know many atoms um, in terms of um, the uh, 
the the amount of polarization they're spread over is um, can be two thousand atoms worth. So you can understand that one photon is thicker than the surface. So you know half of these little bits could get knocked off. Just one of them could be knocked off by actually hitting the surface. So when it goes through, some of these bits are going to be broken. They're they're going to be missing. You know there's, this one's missing a piece of their frequency. So a piece of the um, logic even you could think of this as bits and so there's a bit missing you know instead of a one zero it's got a one naught you know and real naught not even a zero <laughs> you know and so there's no signal going to get to the other side because it's it's broken its ray you know the the it has you know like I said for the human eye you need six or nine of these things and all you got to do is get rid of one and you're not going to see the photon photon's still there and substance but it's missing one component and one component's enough. And so the idea is, is you got a bunch of broken pieces. Well, the other thing that's happening is there's a, there's a bunch of electrons on the surface, okay, all around any kind of change in surfaces. You have a bunch of um, sort of, first of all, atoms are, you know, atoms of the material are going into the atmosphere and then going right back again. So there's a lot of movement of atomic structure. And so there's a lot of loose bits in here, little bits of transition material from the atmosphere to the surface. Uh, the surface is always kind of active. And it's never just a flat surface. It's always got stuff around it, is the point. And that's the surface that does the same thing for stuff like, um, you know, when light <coughs> diffracts, when it uh, changes from one medium to another, the light bends. It's the same mechanism in the sense that the surface does it because the light has to transition from one medium into another medium and the atomic structures are different and that's what's causing the bending of the light in the sense that the light is in fact probably traveling all of these directions um, but there's only one that you're going to see it at. Okay, <laughs> So especially when you're using monochromatic light there's only one path that will um, create the equal distanceness you need to um, remake a photon. The distance that is exactly a wavelength distance. So I suppose that's a, f a way of describing this is really it's just a, another form of the diffraction of light, a refraction of light as it migrates through surfaces. So the idea is you're tra actually traveling through the surface this way. And that's the only real difference. So some of the photons are going to be, they're going to actually plow into the surface and be killed. And then some of the photons, pieces of them, are going to go through this mixed area, this surface area. And those photons are going to be spread. So when they hit an electron, they can um, They'll be changed in their path, sort of like a Feynman diagram. The two things will hit. Uh, you know, the electron gets hit by a force. The electron has a motivation built into it. It already had a little bit of a momentum in some direction. It moves a little bit this way. The photon is readmitted this way, that kind of thing. So it's perfectly within the boundaries of conventional physics to understand those interactions. Um, so the point is, is that light will Part of the photons will be broken by the fact that the surface will absorb them. Some of them will go through this this medium between the surfaces, and they will, depending on maybe how close they are to the surface and how far away they are from the surface, how much energy they're going to be bent by, how much they're going to be bent. But the point is, is they'll come out of here in... Um, different angles. They're going to spread. Fewer of them, the sharpest angle. More of them, the less sharp angles. So they're going to be spread by a, a factor, um, you know, proportional factor. You know, more, more in one, more in the less amounts and less in the more amounts. Um, and <clears throat> all you're going to do now, so, so now you have photon pieces that are broken by missing elements. And then you have some pieces that are broken, okay, in the sense that 
one element of them was sent this way. So this one element was sent over here, and this element was sent over there. And so they're broken because their elements are now going someplace else. And um, all you're going to now do is you have a surface, and you're going to say, what am I seeing? And where can I see it? And that's all that's going to happen. So, um, and like I said, this really holds for refraction also. So, um, <clears throat> so to draw it, uh, so you have your surfaces, and then you have this kind of simple math that's just going to say to you, okay, I have pieces that are going to go from this surface, and I have a piece going from this surface. And there's always going to be these two lines. So no matter where I go, I have these two lines to get back to where this, this event took place. Now, the event could be a little bit away from the surface, a little bit here. It could be, you know, there's some variation. So that's why it doesn't go to one direct point and it says red. You know, it could be, you know, red from here is the same distance. So what you're looking for is a change in the distance. That is this amount here, you know, in terms of how much more distance did this travel to get to this location. And when this equals the wavelength, one wavelength, that just means that now you can line the photons back up in the sense you have another, you had another photon that was broken, okay, that has the same frequency. It's just that it started earlier or it started later. So when you're changing the phase, all you're really doing is saying, um, I'm just changing the timing that I'm, I'm interacting with the bit of the photon. And <clears throat> so I can use, you know, the first bit from one photon, and I could use the second bit from this photon, and I could use the third bit from this photon, let's say, and I could use the fourth bit from this one in terms of putting something back together. All I need is the pieces. So I can take the, f the first hit can be from this path, you know, this, this path. The first little clump comes from this path. And then the next clump comes from this path, and it was really the third bit of that photon, but it doesn't matter because all we're doing is rebuilding. And then the fifth bit comes from this path again, and because it's not been disturbed. And so all you're doing is reconstructing the right frequency and the uh, necessary amount at that frequency. And then you'll say, okay, there's light hits this surface and it will light up in this area. Now, but if I go a little bit further away, the problem is, is that you're not going to get any light there, okay, um, because there isn't this, this distance here, okay, this extra distance isn't going to be a wavelength. And so nothing will show up here because you can't reconstruct a photon. This distance isn't proportional to this distance. That is the, the frequency needed, okay, is not the proper amount to be able to reconstruct the photon. So the two photons are essentially, the clumps are coming in the wrong timing and you can't reconstruct uh, the right frequency. You construct some other frequency that's not visible. Um, so you're out of luck. So you have a dark spot band. Now, it doesn't mean there's no photons. In the sense, it doesn't mean no energy is going there. There's the same amount of energy. Just the energy is in this broken form. That is, it's not hitting coherently at the white right wavelength. So you have this, you know, where things are in the wrong order and the spread is wrong, but you still have a lot of energy hitting, so it's not a photon. Let's understand, photons are incredibly weak uh, in terms of how much energy, you know, so we see all this light, and we say, you know, it's, uh, it's like a lot of energy, but it's a tiny amount of energy when you think about how much energy it takes to actually move something with light. So you can understand, like, the energy inside a magnet is, you know, a million or a billion times more um, powerful than uh, the common photons you see. Um, so we can't measure. It's such a small amount of energy, we can't really measure it except when it shows up as a 
recognizable photon because then it's moving electrons and we can see when electrons move. But if it doesn't move the electrons enough, we can't understand it as being a real event that had real energy in it. So, um, so comparing it to the refraction argument, because it's the same argument, is that so, so the baseline is thing to understand is that when the light goes through the slits, it's diverging in all directions. It's spreading to all these places. So both sides are spreading the light okay, to all locations. And you're just saying, where can I reconstruct a photon of red, blue, green? You know, where is a location where the distance from here, where I'm getting some pieces, and the distance from here, okay, add up to being a whole wavelength. That is, I can now remake the photon. I've got them back in. Instead of being in the wrong order, I've got them lined up in the right order, um, the right phase. And that's where you see the bands of light. Um, and the same is happening. Uh, same thing <coughs> is happening when you're going to shine light into water, like a laser beam, and it deflects, and then you have another surface, and it deflects back again. Um, when you do that with monochromatic light, you can see this beam going through the water, because it hits some impurities. You know, put some milk in there, and you can see it quite clearly, and it has a specific color. But the light really did go in all these directions. I mean, it really is going in all these directions. And this is the path you're seeing, okay? That's the path where the reconstruction takes place here, um, you know, going through the surface. And so that's why you see the light as a specific um, angle being bent is because that's where you're putting only one kind of light in. It's bending well, yeah, it's, I think it's, if I put white light in, then I would get bending in all these directions. So that's the real thing, you know, is that it would bend this much. Each color is going to bend a certain amount, but the amount it's bending is happening on this top surface. So you have to sort of think of the surface as this, it, ha it is a surface, and then there's this layer. So there's like this fake line above that surface. And the refraction is happening in this area. So what happens is, is it's really spreading here to the surface. And then that beam is what travels through. So that's so thin. This, 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 this surface, this transition, is like a, itself a thin film. And all it's going to do is it's going to take the light that comes in and it's going to mix it in the sense that there'll be all these little angles inside of that surface itself. So that's what I sort of wanted to say. Um, and then this beam will be a little bit wider because of that spreading that happened there. And then, so the spreading doesn't come down this way. It happens here on the surface and then so there's just this minute amount of it that you can perceive. And then the beam goes about its travel. So it gets a little thicker as it goes through each one of those surfaces. Um, but the real, the real breaking and making of the photons took place right here. This is the receiving surface, is really the hard surface, is the one that's going to receive the light essentially and transmit it. All right, that's probably the way I should have said it. All right, but anyway, the point is is that, uh, like in a prism, you can sort of see it with a prism because that does spread the light and then segregates the colors, but it's not segregating the colors through the prism. It's, it's segregating them based on where you're going to be able to see them. But anyway, I should just keep to this. I'll just keep to the slit experiments because there's no point in making it any more complicated. So in the double slit, what ends up making two patterns is, is that you do have four sources. And they're all pushing light in all directions. And so you end up with a pattern built into the pattern 
because you will have angles from here and then angles from here okay and this can be you know even though it's much longer path from for this side it can be whole wavelengths that is the distance can be the right amount of distance extra distance traveled to realign the photons again and to remake one in this location and so that's why the pattern gets more complicated because you're not just using two sources that can only provide really two um, possible um, see and technically you could end up having this also contribute so you could get one bit from this line creates one part of the photon the next bit of the photon at the right distance comes from this location and the third bit could be coming from this location and so you're remaking your photon out of three different photons that were went into the um, slits <coughs> three different photons that would have been received as photons because they have the right um, frequency and the right amount of confined space and so those photons were pieces of them were broken and you're recombining out of those three different photons even a fourth photon here so you could have four different four different broken photon pieces and reconstruct a photon at the new location all right so anyway so that's the the general explanation and all you're really seeing there is if if you use white light and you end up with you know red and then blue you, know, you have a red band and you have a blue band here and then you have another blue band here <coughs> anyway um those blue bands are also in all of these locations in a sense that the <laughs> the light that they were made out of is really spreading to all those locations but the <coughs> you can only have the phase right at these specific places is, are the phases recombined so the pieces are still hitting these other locations it's only in specific locations that you can put them back together into a long enough <coughs> chain of photons with the right frequency and so <coughs> there really isn't <coughs> and there's no interference or, or communication between the bits or any of that kind of stuff then the blue ones are spreading just as much as the red ones are spreading it's just that because of the <coughs> because blue has a <coughs> a closer frequency that is as a smaller wavelength you have the opportunity to make a blue photon at a closer to the center location because this distance is essentially equal to proportional to the wavelength of the um, photon in terms of which ones are going to reconstruct so they're back on phase sooner you know you can <clears throat> you can put t two photons you know photons that have close wavelength versus photons that have a wide wavelength you can readjust these with a lot less space you need a less distance to have to, to remake to re overlap these these overlap so if I had this on a card and I moved it you could see that these would only realign once every 10 inches and these would realign every two inches um, you know or something like that um, <clears throat> you know where they'd overlap so that's why the the blue ends up having a the first band and then it goes to the green and red and I mean it's you know and they're sequential so the photons themselves aren't creating the pattern um, in the sense that the same amount of energy is hitting the entire thing you're just picking up the spots where there's the most remade photons where you've put the phase you've remade the phase and by remaking the phase you can have missing bits and still have whole photons yeah. not perfect but good enough <clears throat> all right so we'll call it a video and such uh, just an update so um, pretty confident about all of that stuff so there's no destructive interference there's just constructive reconstruction that is where you take broken pieces and turn them back into a visible photon where they were broken from being a visible photon by the process of going through the slits and now there's locations <laughs> you can move to different locations or distances <clears throat> and you'll remake the photons in 
different places. I mean, obviously, if I move the target that you're bouncing the pattern off of, that you're viewing the pattern on, you're clearly changing what photons you're seeing as you move the target. You're seeing the rebuilding of a different photon. So the pieces that are already there, that's another way of understanding how the energy's already got to be there in space. <clears throat> that the blank spots are actually getting just as much energy because all I have to do <coughs> to see that is move the target. So the target at this distance has bands here, 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 right? And I move the target closer to the slits, all right? And now the bands are here, you know, here. They might be exactly where the dark spots were before, you know. So, <clears throat> um, just by moving the target. And what have I done by moving the target is I've changed the amount of this distance. This extra distance changes. And as the extra distance changes in proportion to this distance, I'll be able to reconstruct or not reconstruct the photon. So you can sort of see that <clears throat> if I extend this line, these two would cross here. You know, this isn't going to be any good. <laughs> they would end up in completely different locations. So the photon I see here isn't going to be the photon I see here. So when I move the target at all, I'm changing what photons I'm rebuilding. So they obviously already have to be here. You know, and all these dark spots have to have a bunch of stuff hitting them. Because all I have to do is move this forward or back a little bit, and all of a sudden this spot is going to have a photon on it, and this spot's going to have a photon on it. And it's not going to be the same one because they travel in straight lines. So this one is good for right to here, but it's no good out here. You know, and so the angles change is when you get the change in the, the distances. And as you spread, as you move it further away, obviously you change the distance not only of this line, but you also change the distance of this line and this line and all those lines and where they're going to meet. So you change the focus, essentially. And as you change the focus, you change which photon you're going to see, which clump of energy. But the energy has to already be in all these places, right? As I move it in, <coughs> this will, as I move the target in, this will go from being a bright spot to being a dark spot. All right, uh, dark spot, bright spot, dark spot, bright spot, dark spot. That'll actually happen as you move. And one particular spot on the target will change from on, off, on, off, on, off. It's not because the photons <coughs> are turning on and off. It's not because this space is, has any difference. These photons are on their way. These rays, these waves, whatever you want to call them, they're all on their way. You, you can't change them. <coughs> so all you're changing is whether... The distances are equal to a wavelength, a whole wavelength. You're remaking the photon, breaking, remaking, just by changing the focal point. But the energy is going somewhere else, and it'll be a. If you move to that focus, then they'll come on, they'll collide there at the right frequency. So it just has to do with that remaking the energy, and the energy all there all the time. <clears throat> there is no destructive interference. Nothing was destroyed. The photon is there. It's just the, the broken pieces are, were left too broken. They weren't back on phase. So you had the pieces, but they weren't in alignment. So you couldn't remake them into a sequence of a frequency. <clears throat> That's the point I should have emphasized. So anyway, <laughs> until next time and such. Uh, it's the reasonable explanation. Like I said, I didn't go into their theory, which is, again, you can't even make any sense out of it. Two different fields expanding. Fields are affecting one electron somehow when they're, again, the fields are perturbating at thousands of atoms worth of distance. And yet we're to believe that that, whatever it is, moving this way and moving this way in fields this big, is hitting one little spot this small. Can't be the right answer. <laughs> Just can't be. So anyway, till next time. And such.